Our next discussion is about cross-border investments. And on the panel, we have Charles Rim, the general partner at Access Ventures, Sung Han, the partner at Central Ventures, as well as Eric Yu, the managing director at KB Investment. Now, Charles, of course, leads the Hong Kong-based VC firm Access Ventures, making cross-border investment between Southeast Asia and Korea. Uh, Sung, who is joining me in the Singapore studio, is working at Central Ventures. It's a Singapore-based VC implementing regional investment, and of course, they're eyeing expanding into Korea. And Eric finally is in charge of Southeast Asia investment at Korean VC House, working closely with Indonesian player M. BI Ventures. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining me today in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, of course, uh, we're doing a remote version. This is the new world, this hybrid, right? Um, I suppose let's start off by getting a brief introduction about yourself and the company that you work for. Can I start with Charles, please? Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, we started Access Ventures with my partner, John uh, about four years ago, which was in 2017 in Fund One. And last year we did launch our second fund. Uh, I'm based in Seoul, uh, but obviously spend a lot of my time down in uh, Southeast Asia. Our core markets that we invest in are Indonesia, Vietnam, with a number of Singaporean investments as well, uh, operating in those, in those markets. Uh, a third of our portfolio are Korean companies, uh, many of which uh, are regional global businesses and uh, with an operational focus in Southeast Asia. So to create a bridge between both markets is one of our uh, strategies. Uh, Sang, of course, you're in the Singapore studio with me. Tell us a bit about yourself and your company. A firm based in Singapore. Uh, we like to invest in uh, startups that have some proof points led by ambitious founders uh, that are operating in sectors that are ready for digitalization. And I think uh, based out of Singapore, we've been able to cover most of Southeast Asia. Back over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Sang. Uh, and finally, Eric, tell us about yourself and your company. Yeah. Thanks for inviting and I'll to be here. Uh, so we set up the fund here in year 2019. So it's a very uh, unique structures we have because we have a joint venturing with the MDI ventures. So MDI is a corporate backed CBC uh, by uh, Indonesia, uh, Telcom Indonesia. So the basic concept was uh, we're building the business for the digitization of something in the Southeast Asia. And then we also are aggressively uh, back up the startups by the, our business assets, not only from the Telecom Indonesia, but also our heavy holdings. Uh, and so this kind of uh, corporate backed PC, we, we are now uh, kind of test about how can we support and then providing our uh, capital service to the startup is a current situation. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now we have a better understanding of what we're about to get into, which is cross-border investment. Uh, but really, all of this is on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis that we're sort of going through, right? Uh, and you realize through the course of the year 2020 that no one is alone. No one's an island. No country or startup or business can deal with it alone, which is why it's so important to build that close relationship um, beyond borders in that sense. So uh, I want to start off with a very common question. I mean, uh, we see how ASEAN has been making various partnerships, even the EU is interested and whatnot. Um, but I'm curious about the relationship between ASEAN and Korea. And Eric, I was hoping you could help me out with this first question. Uh, why is it ASEAN and Korea need each other? Could you, could you share with us your view on each region and their specific needs and how that can be addressed with capital investment? Oh, yes. Uh, so fundamentally, when we set up the funds, or the before the funds, uh, I start up. Uh, I'm starting investing to Southeast Asia since the year 2013 or 15. The original idea was uh, the potential market up there, because the digital digitalization around the world, and of course, a lot of the country has the same situation. Southeast Asia has a a lot of the a potential market there. Uh, in terms of the population, GDP growth, et cetera. And also there was the huge demands for 
digitalization because of there is no legacy such as uh, China and also Southeast Asia can learning something from the Chinese case. And then also the at the time the Southeast Asia always welcoming to uh, foreign investors. And then from the my Korean investors perspective, uh, I'll put to the market up there. Uh, uh, one more thing is market side here and the capital side here. So in case of the capital market, okay, let's focus on the VC. So at the time, year, during the year 2015 to 17, 18, a lot of the VC markets, uh, they're growing very fast and then new VC funds come to the market and the capital size grows to 1 billion to 5 billion. So in the sense, uh, if we, making the some profit by the capital uh it's really hard to uh get the, some high upside from the only investing to korea so we need to have the, some other schemes to deploy the capital to the foreign country and of course the china is very competitive and the us is far away india is new coming up and southeast asia is quite a suitable market because in terms of capital uh we are ready on to the deploy but also from the Korean startups and Korean typical giant company is always keen to looking at Southeast Asia as a, a second a foreign market beyond China. So strategically, uh, we're looking at the market potential and capital deployment and business demands all together put together. Uh, is a kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a kind of suitable market for me to look at Southeast Asia. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Eric. It's like, don't put all your eggs in one basket, Sang. Uh, you're here in Singapore. Uh, why is it, and, and the same question for you as well. I mean, why does the ASEAN and Korean basket look so exciting? Sure. Uh, first off, wonderful comments fr from Eric. Uh, if I can offer some comments from my perspective of having lived here in Singapore for over 12 years and also being a Korean, uh, maybe I want to start with something that is a bit of a high-level view. Uh, Korea has managed to develop and advance to a kind of a level in economic growth where there's a lot of accumulated technology and services know-how and expertise. If you look at Southeast Asia, on the other hand, although I don't want to generalize, you have a number of countries uh, that have the massive potential to grow with a lot of unmet needs that require these tools of technology and services know-how that are waiting to be unlocked. And uh, I think uh, if you combine Korean uh, services and know-how with capital, and I'll elaborate on that uh, from a VC perspective a bit later, what you have is this tool that is very uniquely uh, suited for Southeast Asia to help some of these countries, some of these industries and uh, companies achieve the kind of scale that allows them to maybe uh, get closer to a form or a size or a company uh, uh, style or pattern uh, that would be, I would say, ideal. And I would maybe classify that as being a bit like a unicorn. But uh, I, I digress. So the combination of this sort of bi-directional flow, uh, know-how and capital, uh, that is finding its way from Korea into Southeast Asia and a massive market that has a lot of unmet needs uh, is basically a very tantalizing proposition. And I'm just going to leave it there at a high level. Yeah, there's also the, the very invisible thing that we don't see in the fact that culturally it's very easy to accept one another in this part of the world. So it does make things moving forward a lot easier in that sense. And I, again, I say it's, it's more of an underlying invisible thing. Uh, uh, Charles, I'd, I'd like to pose the same question to you, if I may. Uh, why is it Korea and ASEAN? Why do we need each other? What can we gain out of each other? Uh, maybe I should start with some historical perspective. If you look, uh, Korea has always been the number one or two FDI, foreign direct investor, in the markets that I'm active in, Vietnam and Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia forever. If you look at Vietnam today, they say that anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of GDP is generated by uh, Korean companies such as Samsung, right? Uh, and Indonesia, you know, I lived in Indonesia in the mid 90s. I was an IPO banker at the time. And there are significant amounts of Korean companies. You know, the first wave were manufacturers, then hardware, and now we're seeing software. So there's that historical background that's there. Uh, the Koreans have done a lot of business in those markets. So I think that wave is just extending 
with uh, digital, you know, the digital uh, market as well. Uh, I think Eric and, and Sango made great points about capital flow. There's a lot of capital in Korea to be invested in those markets as they look for more growth opportunities. So um, I think there's a, a, you know, a lot to learn, a lot to benefit from Korean capital going down to, to those markets. Um, and, and, and again, the growth opportunities in Korea are getting more limited. So you know, I think we're also seeing strong Korean entrepreneurs going after those markets. And you know, one of our latest investments is a Korean team, Korean company, but their core business is in Indonesia. Yeah, Charles, you kind of helped set up the uh, the next issue you want to do it. Looking looking at opportunities is one thing, but seeing other people's problems also does present an opportunity. And that's what we tend to do. We see an area with a problem, we feel we have a solution, and that's the opportunity. Now, if you're in the venture capital world, I assume you come up with a solution through investment. So in that sense, uh, Charles, I'd like to start with you. I'm quite curious uh, in your experience, in your travels, what are some of the problems you found and how have you found that, you know, helping solve these problems through investment and activities? How, how far has that gone? Do you have any stories that you could share with us? Sure. Um, you know, I think um, obviously to fuel startups, capital is a very important requirement. But more important than capital is actually strategy and experience. So, um, you know, one of the things that really benefits Silicon Valley is, is the tiers of experienced entrepreneurs who play a role as uh, mentors to the next generation. And we see that play out in Korea, where, you know, the first unicorns were established a decade ago or more. Uh, I think uh, Southeast Asia doesn't have that benefit, right? We are now starting to see unicorns, but it's the same generation. So having more uh, mentors as well as capital, people with experience to come down to the market and provide that uh, support. Uh, as you probably know, you know, in the startup environment, uh, those things are very critical, right? Startup founders uh, rarely can do everything themselves. So more than the capital, it's really the resources that they can bring to bear from bringing in investors with that experience and that network to be able to connect them um, to whether it's partnerships, uh, helping them in terms of recruiting, or helping them with insights in terms of what, you know, what is what is short, and you know, one of the key areas is technical technical capabilities, right? The uh, you know the engineer uh, short shortage is acute everywhere, but no more acute in South than in Southeast Asia. So I think that's a very important one. I want to pick up on that point uh, for you, Sang. Uh, talking about talent shortage in that sense. I mean, we've had discussions for the longest time, Industry 4.0, uh, talent shortage in the tech sector. And, you know, on the on the topic of solving problems through investment, there is also, investment is also a way of bringing in expertise to help spread the knowledge in that sense. What are your thoughts on, on solving problems through investment? Well, as a VC, I think the, the sort of the tool that I have imagining being a hammer that I can bring to bear is probably trying to invest into startups that immediately address that talent gap. And I think the knee-jerk reaction is to go after educational technology companies, which I think in certain markets such as Korea and China have uh, more or less been played out uh, with varying degrees of successful outcomes. For Southeast Asia, I think the notion of what uh, an educational technology investment thesis uh, represents is slightly different. And that, that would play out in ways where, as a VC, we would try to solve that same question going after a different set of companies in a different industry. And what I mean by that is, imagine that you're a parent in a Southeast Asian household trying to um, um, look out for uh, their kids. Uh, if I were a Korean family, the first impression I'd have of trying to support the kids would be to uh, try to back and, and support as much of some kind of an educational tuition effort as possible, right? I think in Southeast Asia, rather than going for something that is so long-term minded, it is probably a lot more efficient and also makes sense in terms of uh, helping out the household directly by going after something that is a bit like a job tech play. So uh, I think uh, one insight that, that we're still trying to develop is that maybe in Southeast Asia, uh, instead of going after an educational tech uh, VC investment thesis, it makes maybe more sense to try to focus on the earlier stage um, job tech opportunities that are springing up. And we're sort of uh, covering both white collar as well as the traditional blue collar, but I think that kind of distinction may not necessarily apply. 
Okay, uh, but uh, very relevant in the sense that people are, are losing jobs and having to pivot I in in that sense. Uh, Eric, I want to turn the attention to you. The two gentlemen have shared their experience. Uh, for you, talking about uh, using investment to solve problems, uh, what's your methodology? What would you share with us? So many cases from the Korea and Southeast Asia might be a something different. It's a definition of solving the problem by the investment. So mostly in case of the Korea, uh, VCs, uh, uh, some, uh, we call it the patient capital and that we are supportive to the founders set up the business. And something like um, in case of the Korea, I see the many cases that um, uh, uh, of Oh, I can call it the more chairman driven cultures. So we are much more depends in uh, depends on the, the capability of the founders or chairmen which means that they set up the business and that we much more uh, be a supportive to the founders, but not to be a more, more than that kind of the rights. I mean, supportive, but not aggressive. Case of the career. of course, it depends on the which kind of the VCs and strategy they have. But the Southeast Asian case, a little bit different. It's more board members driven cultures. It means uh, the founders are also very important and their capability and business asset is set up by the founders, but also the board members uh, consistently uh, input them. Uh, kind of give them many inputs about the business. So from the, my case, uh, capital side and board member driven business, I have the two functions on there. First is a, a capital with uh, so many knowledge and uh, positioning from the strategic settings. So which means that the, because of the Southeast Asia, there is a no legacy. So there was potential up there, but kind of complexity and volatility also together. So it's very important to set up the, some, how the corporate need to be or what is a strategic position should be. But sometimes founders are too much dedicated to one thing that operations uh, focus on so much. And so which means that sometimes they can lose the directions, not lose, but and, uh, we can you can see the many directions, but founders sometimes can lose in the uh, right directions or some wrong directions. So at the times of both board members, the assets, knowledge, capital to set up the options is the one thing. Another thing is the this is more things I think so the information gap here. Is information gap between startups, corporation, and investors. But founder, uh, but investors always looking at the, some speaking of the founders or very um, particular information we can get. So sometimes uh, we 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 cannot share the completely about the corporation's information. Another thing is also the market information. So founders too much dedicated into the operation, then sometimes they losing the information of the market. So we are trying to narrow down the gap these two dimensions, which means always investors capital side dedicate to know about the corporation uh, clearly, and then always input to something strategy on what about the market. At the same time, uh, we always trying to give us some market information such as a competitive landscape or new trends uh, or sort of big events to get in, uh, impact on the corporation's strategy is a kind of, uh, that is a kind of service from the capital side, I think. So those two things can combination together and we believe that the uh, founders, capital, those two combination can solving the problem very well in the market. Mm. It's definitely a little bit more than just pumping in money into the situation. The VC is really offering that expertise and helping to gain focus. Uh, Eric, uh, uh, Sang rather, uh, I want to I wanna throw this question, this next question to you, because what Eric was talking about earlier on is really between the VC and the, the startup or the company. Uh, if I were to zoom out, and this is a bit of a two-part question, if I were to zoom out, 
you know, normally when you enter another country, there's bound to be one or two barriers. It happens. Uh, in your experience, what do you think has been the hardest barrier to overcome? And what would you say or what would you suggest, in your opinion, uh, that governments can do to improve cross-border investments? What are your hopes in that sense? Oh, and I thought <laughs> I'd be getting the easy <laughs> ones, right? So um, I, I think as a VC, if I want to keep it a bit more tactical, sure. then uh, I, the, the typical challenges for entering into a new country where we haven't done any transactions before can be broken down into roughly, I think, two buckets. The first one would be deal flow access. The second one would be execution or transaction execution. I think the second part, uh, more or less, I is a problem you can solve uh, commensurate with how much money you can throw at it, depending on how expensive your lawyers are. Uh, there's some risk management that we'll have to follow uh, after the deal has been done. It's probably the first bucket that is more meaningful, uh, and I think uh, Korean investors, uh, both GPs and LPs, that seek to have uh, some uh, visibility into what's going on in Southeast Asia, uh, I think are trying very hard to make sure that that first bucket is very well uh, addressed. Um, I see uh, very um, uh, obvious, or at least at the same time, uh, very reasonable and rational strategies of certain limited partners working with uh, very local teams, uh, very early stage, where if they put in money as a limited partner, they get access into uh, pre-seed or even seed stage deals, and that itself will uh, result in some form of um, targetable Series A opportunities and beyond thereafter. For GPs, uh, I think there's always the, uh, the desire to be able to do this in-house. And it does make sense, but it's al also quite challenging uh, for, let's say, a non-local VC firm. And I'm re uh, referring mainly to Korean firms, uh, trying to establish some form of local presence. And I think having a local presence is much better than having none. Uh, but at the same time, there are cases of certain fund managers being able to overcome that uh, deal flow access challenge uh, relatively uh, in the early stages, uh, mainly because of the way that some of the deal flow kind of finds its way to uh, the right investors. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right, Sam, very nicely handled. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, Charles, same question for you. Um, for you personally, what have you seen ha has been the hardest barrier when it comes to entering new markets? And in your opinion or your hope, what do you think uh, countries can do to help encourage cross-border investments? Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the 90s, I used to be an IPO banker in Indonesia. And getting IPOs listed through BAPAPOM was very difficult. Uh, it was opaque. Uh, the regulations were not that clear. Uh, and so it was very difficult. And my experience with my VC fund in the last five years has been very, very good. So Indonesia has done uh, so much to improve itself in terms of its transparency, uh, getting approvals done. Uh, you can be relatively sure about the time that's required to process that. And I think Vietnam in the last five years has done a lot to improve, but has more to improve, right? And you see the advent of uh, many investors requiring companies to flip, which means to create Singapore entities in order to invest. And all that is because of the difficulties of regulatory approvals and in getting investments in and out of the country. Um, so I don't think that's a good thing. I think uh, with more uh, ease of regulatory approvals, then we won't see that requirement anymore. So that needs to improve. Uh, the other thing is obviously foreign limitations, right? In, in various industries, there are limitations of foreign ownership, which creates barriers. Now that takes time because you know, we had it in Korea too. 20, 25 years ago, many industries were protected with foreign limitations. Those have all gone away. So I expect that's a matter of time, but when that does, that will make it easier too. Thank you very much, Charles. I really like the Vietnam example. It is something we're all paying attention to. Uh, Eric, your turn. Uh, same question, uh, really talking about some of the barriers you think are, are problems in terms of entering new markets and what you hope that governments could perhaps do to encourage cross-border investments. Uh, um, um, thanks very much, Rachel. I'm always a beneficiary from the government back work. Because uh, we we co we we working together with um, a state-owned company, and then also the KB Holdings itself was used to a state-owned. So we are pretty much. I think that we are um, 
we assume that we're familiar with the government side. However, uh, for the investment, maybe there are two to three things to need here. Um, first, of course, uh, already the two persons mentioned about regulation. So market side of regulation first and the capital side and the investment activity, those three things is uh, uh, always um, uh, assume, uh, always want to say something about to, uh, uh, the regulation of policy makers. So in terms of the, the market side, of course, the regulation is the first priority. But uh, thank you for the situation of many uh, Southeast Asian cases. Now we are not uh, limited about uh, foreign investment. Of course, sometimes in Vietnam or uh, Malaysia, we need to uh, we need to prove a lot of uh, process to invest into the invest uh, particular domains such as retail or medical things, or sometimes a particular cert certain industry they have a limitation to about thirty percent of the foreign investors or uh, or shoes a lot of documentation to improve the who we are and the KYC and how what kind of our money is. But I believe that those kind of regulation thing is going to better way in near futures because Southeast Asia and East Asia and other Asia are always uh, getting more closer and closer. So uh, they are more incentivized to open the market because they are already enjoying some capital deployed from the foreign, invest, uh, foreign investors to uh, generate a new uh, digitalized uh, industry. And capital side, uh, capital side, I think in case of Korea, we are very uh, beneficial from the sovereign, many sovereign funds uh, to, because uh, our Korean uh, government always encouraging the foreign activity because we, our domestic market is somewhat a little bit limited. So, or startups or mid-sized company always uh, uh, have having a motivation to go to the world. In that sense, even we are GP of the Korean, but sometimes we are uh, beneficial from the LPs from the Korea side to invest into Southeast Asia. So this is one of the advantages in another country. Uh, mostly, generally thinking, uh, uh, normally, the many uh, private LPs don't want to invest into Korean GP who are investing in Southeast Asia. But uh, uh, thank you for the sovereign funds. We are always have a, having a chance to get the <clears throat> uh, uh, get the, some capital uh, LP side of the capital from the sovereign fund, and then those kind of activity can increasing the uh, global investment, and then. So going on to the global investment uh, during the, let's say the 10 years, then also we have a chance to uh, Korea, we, we have a chance to make the Korean startups go to uh, Southeast Asia or another the East Asian country to enrich their market. So that could be a start from the, the sovereign funds help. And investment activity also quite important. Uh, in case of the Korea, we have uh, some of a uh, higher barrier to entering the VC, a set of the VC, or set of the GP uh, as a venture capital because uh, they require some certain amount of the capital, or paid in capital, or certain amount of balance sheet situation. But investment should be an uh, investment. So, uh, if in order to increase the more uh, global investment, the uh, uh, policymaker more open to the investment market to set up the GP or fund more easily. And plus, uh, somebody who has uh, some track record, not only in the Korea, but also the Asian market. And those guys should be more easier to open the, the fund to invest into globally. All right. Thank you very much for sharing with us your thoughts. Uh, we've been talking about how to boost cooperation between ASEAN and Korea through investment. Uh, my guests this afternoon have been Charles Rim, the general partner at Access Ventures, Sang Han, the partner at Central Ventures, as well as Eric Yu, the managing director at KB Investment. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today, and I really hope we get to do this again soon. Thank you for having us.